And we have this um, this afternoon, uh, we have a presentation dedicated to uh, geological modeling via um, an open source package uh, that is called GEMPI, or two open source packages called GEMPI and GEMGIS. And this presentation is done by Florian Willman from the University of Aachen and was supposed to be done by Alexander Juster as well, but um, as Florian said, uh, Alexander won't be with, uh, with us. Hello, Florian. Thank you to be to be with us today. So, just a, a few words to a few words to present you. Um, I would say that uh, Florian combines uh, geological modeling and, and geophysical process simulation, especially with uh, looking at the at the uncertainties on that uh, on that topics. And uh, Florian is the head of the Institute uh, of Computational Geosciences in the uh, RWTH Aron University. And Alexander, uh, who was planned to, to be with us uh, this afternoon, is a PhD candidate in the same university and also researcher assistant at the Competence uh, Center Exploration and Reservoir Simulation. And uh, Alexander is the main developer of the GEM GIS package that will be uh, presented today. Florian? Please, you can start. Thank you very much, and thanks for joining and for uh, having the chance to present our work here. And nice to see some familiar people, familiar faces. Um, yeah, so uh, when um, Philippe asked me to present a bit some of our work, I tried to put a lot of different aspects together here in, in the, the 40, 45 minutes we have. Um, as uh, Philippe already said, it's basically about geological modeling, our main package, GEMPI, and I wanted to show a little bit around uh, GEMGIS, which is an addition to GEMPI that we are working on to make um, the, uh, especially interaction with models and data a bit more easy. So let's see, I hope this works now. Um, just had some, probably, is it now showing the single slide or is it showing everything? Um, it's showing the just... single slide. No, it's fine. Okay, perfect. Ah, oh, no, it works. Good. So, um, yes, open source geological modeling with GEMPI and uh, GEMGIS, why, when, and how. And I'd like to start a little bit um, with some very uh, simple basics. And um, that's in this audience, I guess, all of you, of course, know all the principles behind geological modeling. I just wanted to say that uh, in geological modeling, if you look at a very simple type of structure, we typically, uh, we often think about these large scale um, structures like what we see in here, um, a nice region in the Alps, uh, and this cross section schematically shown interfaces between layers and maybe offsets along discrete features such as faults. Um, but if we zoom in, of course, we have all geological model aspects or geological features basically across scales, we may have things like sedimentary channels and if we go uh, down to a very small scale we look at really small scale heterogeneities in this case here um, porosity let's say uh, in a rock and one thing i wanted to mention at the beginning when we start out talking about modeling are the different types of methods that me methods <laughs> methods that have been evolved i'd say over the years in these different fields on the smaller scale, uh, quite often we use uh, methods from the field of two-point geostatistics um, to look at things like heterogeneities. If we go to these larger scales, we have um, sedimentary features, aspects like objects that we'd like to model uh, in a discrete way or multi-point geostatistics. Also in this field, we have a lot uh, of the methods from the big field of generative models and machine learning entering right now. And uh, on these large scales, Typically, we have uh, what we call structural modeling or trend modeling sometimes in different fields. And just to put these things a bit apart, I, a lot of this separation comes from tradition, maybe, and, and familiar, familiarity of people with different methods. They can all be applied over multiple scales, I would say, to a certain degree. And today we'll talk about this interface modeling, so modeling on this large scale. Also, on this scale, we have we can look at a variety of methods, uh, starting from interpolation, where we basically uh, have some input points from maybe boreholes or outcrops or picks from seismic lines. And we look at ways to interpolate between those points. Um, then we have also aspects uh, which are a bit more on the field of integrating kinematics into the system. 
let's say we assume that we start out with a, with a simple layer structure, we apply some pre-described folding, so geometrically, basically, we apply kinematic functions to the geometry, and we look at the deformation or at the, at the resulting uh, model. All the way to process simulations, where we really look at the full complexity of starting with a material and we define deformations, physical processes in a dynamic way and so on. And I'm just putting this out here because I think it's, it's important to realize that, of course, the more we go over to the, to the right side over here to these um, considerations of physics and geological concepts, the more we are actually in the field of uh, actually including knowledge from first, princip knowledge from first principles. If we are here on the left side, we are more on the side of direct observations and data density, where we need also a lot of data density basically to create models. And this is also the field uh, that I'm going to talk about today in my presentation. Okay, that was the, let's say the, the, the primaries, but what we also of course want to look at, uh, leave this out here, um, are then what these models look like. And this is the picture that I'd like you to have in mind, of course, when we talk about uh, geological models, we look at uh, different, um, see, can I, see, can I show here the I pointer? Yes, um, laser pointer. Okay, so we look at uh, interfaces in here between different units, um, like over here. We look at faults, uh, thrust faults in here. We look at folding and so on, and typically uh, models on a large scale. Okay, um, another aspect of modeling that uh, I think is important to keep in mind are the different uh, levels of complexity. If we talk about modeling methods, this very schematic and simple picture here, let's say we assume that we have, uh, you know, boreholes and we intersect some uh, interface of interest or some geological interface of interest at a certain depth. And we have three boreholes and they all intersect this layer once. We assume it's a continuous layer, and then we can model this um, by a simple interpolation method, and this can be extended easily to multiple conformal layers. This is arguably the simplest possible setting we can imagine. And uh, in this field, we can apply all types of uh, modeling methods from the field of deterministic to geostatistic interpolations, and what we sometimes can call two and a half D approaches, because basically we have at each point in X, Y, we have one corresponding value in uh, a depth, et cetera, action. It does get a bit more difficult when we start looking at uh, things like faults, fault networks. Uh, in this case, you can see that uh, we may intersect um, this, there's no continuity of the layer, or maybe even if we have something like a reverse fault, we suddenly would intersect this layer twice at each point in X, Y space. And uh, this can be modeled also with a variety of methods. Some of the two and a half D approaches are still applicable if you do domain separation by faults. Um, but this is where we get into the field of real full 3D explicit and implicit geological modeling methods. And this is all the way to let's say really complex structures and interactions. I have here a picture of a folded, overturned fold and an unconformity on top. Uh, or uh, dome structures, and you can see that we intersect now interfaces more than once and also in different orientations, so once normal orientations and once it's flipped. And in these cases, we really need to start looking at um, non-trivial interactions and at these basically full 3D explicit implicit geological modeling methods. And this is also the type of complexity that we are addressing with our uh, modeling code GemPy. So, but before we start now talking about the code itself, um, again, I know many of you here in this uh, audience today are certainly already have, a, have an expertise in, in geological modeling and these interpolation methods, but this is a bit more on the side of computer graphics. So let me just maybe give you this intuition a bit. When I ask you to say, uh, you know, let's look at a, at a 1D curve because before we talk about 2D surfaces and 3D space, Let's look at a, uh, at a at a circle, and um, if I you know, would ask you what I do with my students in class, of course, ask uh, you you know how would you describe this uh, circle with a mathematical method? And um, typically, people of course come up with different uh, options in here, starting from let's say the simplest possible way would be to say well. If I would like to formulate this circle somehow mathematically, maybe I would take many points on this uh, on this circle here, and uh, 
perform linear interpolation between those points. So we need to find the points and we need to define some interpolation function between those one way. Another uh, option that I'm sure comes to mind to many of you is the so-called uh, circle equation and um, trigonometric formulations. Let's look at those two separately. The first thing we need is actually a coordinate system. Okay, that's more or less um, straightforward. And then one of the typical ideas is, of course, to say I have here my coordinate system, my circle is centered in the, in the origin. And each point on this circle now I can actually define through uh, maybe an angle or a, um, the radiant along the circle and sine and cosine of this value. And this is something which uh, well, we all know from basic trigonometry and, and uh, structural geology, of course, as well, it comes in there a lot. We see here, we see this uh, point moving on the circle and the corresponding cosine and sine values give us the X and Y points on the circle. Another formulation, as I said, that comes up typically is this so-called circle equation. And um, this actually gives us uh, an interesting feature. Now, let me see if I actually have the equation in here. I hope otherwise I have to start writing this in. Uh, let me try to write this in quickly. Typically, we do this here with a in class now. Nah, I cannot see my, does not work. Uh, the circle equation is basically um, this equation which tells us x squared plus uh, y squared is uh, r squared. And um, this is an equation that we also know from, from basic maths. And what does it tell us? It's actually giving us a set definition of the circle. It tells us I can take a point x, I can take a point y, and if the square of those, the sum of the square of those values is, sim is equal to the square of the radius, then my point is on a circle. And we can draw this as I did here in a, in a, in a field view. So you see here increasing values outwards, basically this is x squared plus y squared. And we see that our circle here, this blue line is basically the one line which corresponds in this case to a radius of one. And maybe interesting is to think of this also in a, in a 3D view. So you can think of basically this x squared plus y squared summed as a shape. And the circle is where we cut um, this uh, shape with a horizontal plane, which is corresponding to our radius. Now there are two, uh, there's an important difference between those two, basically. Let me go back here. The first one, so if you look at this uh, circle, we can take any value for, in this case, theta, so for the angle, and we directly get a point on our circle. So we can take uh, basically theta between 0 and 360 degrees, and we have all points directly on our circle. If you go to this implicit formulation, then we cannot do that. We have basically, we have to test all of our values x and y and r and we see basically by this uh, procedure that we um, that we determine the points that actually lie on a circle this sounds a bit awkward and uh, maybe a bit somehow strange to to go this complicated way but it has one one very big advantage and this is that we can directly if you look at this field we can take two values x and y and if you take the sum of squares and it's smaller than our radius squared, we know that we are inside of our circle. If it's bigger, we know that it's outside. And the same actually is often relevant for us in, in geology that we would like to know if we are in our models in 3D space somewhere inside a domain or outside of a domain. And this is an information which we directly get through these so-called implicit definitions. And this is the principle that um, you, I guess many of you know, of course, uh, Leapfrog and GeoModeler uh, which use this method, and this is also what GemPy is based on. Okay, so uh, this was a bit of the theoretical background, but maybe important to understand where this is coming from. Um, the, the software, uh, the code itself, GemPy, is based on the theoretical developments uh, which have been published before already, now um, more than 30 years ago, um, by Christian Lajouni et al. And Philippe worked on this, of course, a lot in his, uh, in his career. And um, we use a similar method uh, based on this universal coke rigging, where we take most input data points, we directly get outputs of this uh, cross sections and 3D representations. And I leave again a theory out here more to, to remind us that this is a geostatistical approach. So it is based on uh, the implicit, uh, the, the calculation of this implicit function is based on 
universal core rigging. What do we get, of course, is in the end a nice uh, surface representation of geology. And I'm showing here, it's quite an old screencast, but it shows you the typical setting where we have basically, in this case now, faults here offsetting some layers. Uh, and this is modeled with GemPy, and you see that, you know, if you move one point that you directly update not only one interface, but all interfaces that belong to a single series uh, of this um, implicit field. Okay, let's now though start looking at uh, maybe, ah, I have a, a quick summary maybe of this part here, if you are interested, I know this is uh, recorded here. So if you're watching this recording later on and you'd like to try this out at home, uh, then do so. Uh, this is a very simple 2D case, I think, which is quite instructive um, because it tells you, it shows you how you can basically uh, take different points and you can play around with these, um, with these uh, sliders in here, change the point position, see how this changes this implicit field and how you extract the surfaces from this field. Okay, so a summary, why implicit, and why GemPy? This is, I'm just putting this mostly out here uh, without going into too much detail, but it allows for a very flexible way of modeling. Um, I showed you only briefly that we can use multiple conformal layers, which is something that in geology is quite common, of course, if you have sedimentary sequences that were subsequently deformed, for example. Uh, we can consider interface points and orientations um, and as I said, one of the main advantages in a practical context is that we have this in-out queries directly and orientations and gradients everywhere in space. I'll show you a bit of automation in a minute. Disadvantages, this is uh, for all implicit methods, not only for GemPy, they do have a higher computational cost because we have to calculate these 3D fields. Um, topology can sometimes change easily if you use GeoModeler before or uh, also LeapFrog and other uh, packages in this direction, you know that sometimes you change a point and you get suddenly a blob. Uh, this can happen. Um, it's a strength of these methods and it comes at cost basically that this can also happen sometimes. Okay, but let me uh, show you actually some of the, the models that were created with GemPy. A quick tour uh, of some of the examples. Um, this is a model we've done uh, in, in uh, Perth in Western Australia. Uh, this example and the next one in southern France here, uh, unless they are uh, part of the GemPy tutorial. So if you look on GemPy.org and I'll provide you a link later on, you can actually download and try these, uh, these uh, models yourselves if you're interested. The point here, we're looking at scales of, you know, basin scale, 100 kilometers, 150 kilometers, in this case over here, 50 kilometers, and uh, some faults which are, which are offsetting these sequences. This is uh, another model we've done more recently. Uh, one of our colleagues here in the Permo Carboniferous Trough in Northern Switzerland. Um, you see here a bit more interaction with different types. We see here also topology on top, uh, geological uh, link to a geological map, which is not shown, but this was the main input here as well. And this uh, model basically was based on data from the GeoMole uh, project and uh, also some heat flow maps as a um, as a study on geothermal energy in this region. One more model, which I think is a project is quite nice. You see this should run here. OK, so we have a 3D visualization. This is done with um, one of the packages that we also use with GemPy. This is in PyVista, so a VTK package. This is for the Einstein telescope project, which is the large um, uh, gravitational wave detector project which is currently being you know, determined where this will be located. There are some sites in Europe and one of the potential sites is directly in our backyard here where I'm sitting, so between Aachen, Liege and Maastricht. And uh, we are creating geological models with uncertainties uh, to determine how basically which kind of uh, geological features we would encounter if we were to drill this 30 kilometer tunnel system, so quite a major infrastructure setting. Another big uh, topic is uh, geothermal energy right now in, in Germany um, and also, of course, in whole Europe and many other countries. 
In our region, we are looking at uh, potential sites for geothermal energy. My colleague Alex Jöstl, who was supposed to uh, second me here today in the this, this online talk, um, is actually there today, so he cannot give his presentation, unfortunately. Um, but uh, what we do, of course, is create uh, 3D models for this region. This is the model of Alex, actually. So um, our best prediction for what we will encounter there and we will actually start drilling. We, we are currently doing a, a small preliminary well there, a borehole there, but we will hopefully get a, a deep borehole there soon to, to test our model and to update the model. This is mostly to show you the complexity that we can start get uh, modeled with Gempi. Uh, so we see here the, the foreland of the Eiffel uh, Mountains, basically, which is a complex fold and thrust belt. And uh, this is uh, one of our maybe most complex projects in this interaction of different faults and features, but it shows you how complex this can actually get. Here's a small example also in a cross-section view. Another typical application is to generate models directly from boreholes. This, uh, this is a quick example here of, of a model generated in the Münsterland Basin, uh, where we used boreholes as an input, actually not, I think, not really a lot more. And um, this is arguably a fairly simple setting, but what I show you here also is the way that we typically interact with GemPy. This is mostly through programming in uh, two Python notebooks in Python, programming language Python. And you see here now this uh, modeled interface and um, subsequent layers are being added step by step. But I think we can skip that in the interest of time today. Because what I wanted to show you uh, with Alex is this addition um, and recent development uh, to make this interaction with GemPy a bit more user friendly. You see here, this is basically on the basis of these uh, Python scripts and JuPyter notebooks. And of course, we had feedback from many people that, yes, it's nice if you can do programming, but what if not? And of course, we're all working with GIS databases. So the question was if we can maybe integrate GIS data more seamless into, uh, into GemPy. And this is what the project GemGIS is about. So these are the slides from uh, my colleague Alex, who is uh, working at Fraunhofer IEG and uh, doing his PhD at university at the same time. Just to give you a very quick uh, uh, sense into basically how this works, um, GemGIS is a toolbox also based on Python, also open source, um, which is optimized to work with QGIS, but also works with other GIS packages. Uh, the idea is that we basically go in the usual way that we take a cross section here, um, simply a, um, a visualized a, a picture of a cross section, which is then digitized. So we digitize here the layers of interest, and we have faults in here, and then we have uh, GemGIS, which is then taking this data from QGIS, putting this into uh, suitable data frames, which we can then import directly into GemPy for modeling. I just saw the comment from Philippe. I, I'm don't, I don't see a chat, so if you, is there, is there a chat somewhere? So if you have a question uh, and uh, if you can raise your hand or something, maybe I see that. If not, then please speak up simply or we do the questions later, I think. So um, yeah, this is basically the typical workflow with, uh, G, with uh, GemGIS. It provides also some functionality to filter data sets if you have too much data to extract only a subset of coordinates which you can then use for modeling. Um, it's also a, a way to import other types of geographic data like um, topographic maps, for example, and a way to then go back and visualize uh, results. So the idea is really to have not only a one way from QGIS into over GemGIS to GemPy, but also to be able to take the results, the generated models then back into, into your uh, GIS project in QGIS in this case, and to make this basically uh, interaction in both directions. Uh, GemGIS also has some additional features, which you may also have in some other GIS packages already built in. Uh, we just found this very useful um, as a Python toolbox to support our own model developments. 
you can see here on the right side, this is a, a geophysical log uh, on a borehole. And uh, it also works with, with uh, deviated boreholes. And you can see here the log visualized in, uh, in this, um, this visual plot, basically. Uh, it can also be used to display seismic data uh, in 2D and 3D. So basically, it's a link between um, QGIS and maybe seismic data you may have stored in, or the, the location of the lines basically stored in QGIS. And then visualizing this also in uh, PyVista in 3D. We don't yet have a full picking interaction in 3D, unfortunately. That's something which hopefully will come at some stage. We also use then uh, this GemGIS toolbox to build on top of these different applications. One of those here is actually uh, also a geothermal study. Um, in this case, it's purely looking at data density, but you can see that you can take data sets. In this case, this is, uh, these are, I think, seismic lines, and we generate these data density maps arguably something you could also do in pure GIS, but as I said, it's kind of like this way to make this interaction simpler and maybe to provide some additional features and some additional functionality uh, with a link to um, Python. Okay, this was the short uh, view to GemGIS and I'm happy to take questions or uh, refer you to Alex actually for any questions in this, this package. Um, the last 10 minutes I wanted to use to show you um, some things which go beyond, let's say, structural models using, using GemPy. And one of the features that we are looking at uh, very often is actually in our work, as Philippe already said, one of our core research aspects is looking at uncertainties in geological models. And this is a simple visualization here, very simple GemPy model. But just to show you that, of course, if you start changing input points here, these uh, silver balls that you see in the model down there are the input point to the interface. And let's assume that at the position of this blue mark and uh, this, this gray line, we would look at a potential borehole. One of the aspects that is of interest to us in a practical context quite often is where do we expect to um, find interfaces at depth in a borehole? And one of the work we do is actually to look at uh, uncertainties in geological models and also to then you know, quantify and, um, and uh, visualize uncertainties. And this is something which uh, falls into the field of probabilistic machine learning using uh, geological modeling with GemPy as a basis. Um, you can see basically what we do in here is we are uh, generating different models. We see down here an MCMC -MC approach. I leave also a lot of the details out on this topic. I'll have some uh, of our uh, papers as references in the end. The idea is that we can integrate and fuse different data types, uh, different um, data sets from source, different sources basically in a, um, in a way uh, directly combining geomodeling and geophysics in this case, and then basically sample models that fulfill both of these, uh, the, the information from both data sets, if you like. This is a way, we see this really in a high level, you can think of this as a way to fuse different types of data um, to increase the value of heterogeneous data, I would say. On a scientific level, and also I think, uh, you know, for us and in, uh, in, 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 in for you as practitioners in geological model, modeling, you may have different types of hypotheses about a uh, geological setting. And uh, GemPy is basically providing methods to do fairly straightforward hypothesis testing, you could say. In the end, what this aims for is a full-scale uncertainty quantification. For those of you who are more familiar with these terms, this is uh, going into the direction of probabilistic modeling. As I said at the top, so we enter into this field of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods or higher order inverse, inverse approaches in, in the combination with geophysics. And that's something which, interestingly, maybe this was one of the core purposes why we developed uh, GemPy as an open source package to begin with. It's probably one of the least used uh, methods by people using GemPy in practice. I just would like to make you aware of the fact that this is all under the hood. Basically, this is all there, this functionality. What can we use it for? Um, a very simple example here, but just something which I think is really nicely showing how you can combine different open source modeling pack packages. So here we have a link between GemPy and uh, geophysical method ERT uh, using the uh, Python package PyGimli. 
from our colleagues and from different colleagues uh, in, in Germany. One of those is here in Aachen, Florian Wagner, Professor Wagner. And what we're doing here is basically uh, using measurements from ERT to update our uh, knowledge about the, the, the geophysical in an interface basically between different units. You see the difference below. This is a conventional deterministic approach. At the top, this is this model-based inversion using GemPy, which gives us a very sharp interface if this is what you're looking for, of course. Um, yes, so this is, uh, oh, sorry, this is, oh, yeah, this is an extension to topology where we use, where we combine geological modeli, modeling and topology estimation, and we generate graphs of topology. Topology is telling us a lot about the connectivity in, in, in geology in general. And this is an information that we can use to automatically test, basically, if our models fit uh, to, a, uh, to a certain expected topology. If you've heard talks by Mark Jessel, for example, he's uh, doing a lot of work in this direction um, because of this link between a topology as an abstract representation of geometry. But this is something which we see everywhere, of course, in, in geology as well. I'll leave this out here. One of the aspects I wanted to show you very quickly, I mentioned at the very beginning, these different types of modeling methods, surface methods, and maybe volumetric methods in this case here. This is a model where we generate, we use GemPy to generate interfaces between different geological layers. And then we use geophysical, uh, sorry, geostatistical methods here, the, the GES tools package and other Python package to then generate geostatistical fields. Uh, so SGS, uh, Gaussian random fields inside uh, these domains. Okay. This is bringing me to the last uh, uh, minutes, and I, what I wanted to talk about now is uh, to give you a bit of an insight into GemPy, I call it GemPy the project. Um, the title of this talk was uh, Open Source uh, Geological Modeling, and I know that uh, to many people, it's GemPy could be interesting because it's free, um, and you can use it uh, without any, any licenses and so on. Um, and open source always sounds nice. Uh, you know, I hear a lot that people say, oh, we also have an open source project. So we put our code on GitHub and, and, you know, people can use it. But there is a big difference between putting code out somewhere for people to download and actually developing an open source project. And we, that's something where we invest a lot of time in something which is usually not visible to the outside. So I'd like to show you a bit of uh, how this works and what this means to us and what how we see the future basically of open source geomodeling also in this context. So uh, on the basis, basically, GemPy and GemGIS, they, these are open source projects hosted on GitHub, which is one of the main uh, sites for hosting open source projects. Uh, you can see here the star history, I'm just putting this out there, but this basically shows, uh, gives you a sense of the, the growth of interest in the community. And let me show you what this actually means. If you uh, look at um, a GitHub page, this is the, the GemPy page as of this morning. There are a couple of um, things that uh, are well, interesting from an open source perspective. The first of those are these so-called stars. So this is when people look at the code and think this is actually noteworthy, they can give it a star. In the open source currency, basically, this is something which is important to us, a bit like citations, not, not as prominent, of course, but similar to citations maybe in a, in a scientific paper. Then there are these things which are called forks. And a fork means that someone takes this project and says, I like this project, I would like to continue developing this project in my own work. And you see here that we have 219 forks uh, which are developing different aspects, basically, of GemPy as a project. Then we have pull requests. This is when people actually say, I did something important and I want to give this back to the community. And these are quite often people outside of our core development team. And we have here these issues. And if you click on these issues, what you see is actually a list of uh, questions or problems and, and feature requests and so on that users ask us. And I just want like to show you that basically this is the way to interact with the community and uh, to show you a bit how active this is happening with GemPy. We have at the moment 91 open questions, which is not a simple question. It's usually also a discussion, as you can see on the right hand side. So this is usually questions and answers for with, with users. And uh, you see that we all have more than 650 closed uh, questions. And uh, this is also a big database. If you look at a question, you know, you can go in here and search for problems and people will maybe tell you um, or you will find maybe a solution, hopefully, to this problem. 
Uh, answering this question takes a lot of time and the moment we do this basically next to next to research um, and work. So Alex uh, Yustel, one of the co-authors here in this talk today, and um, uh, Jan Niederau are very active in answering. We try to answer questions, you know, latest a couple of days after they were posed uh, to basically uh, keep uh, people active in their work. Um, but of course, Jampai is not uh, in itself, it's not alone in a void. There is actually, there are lots of open source developments uh, to interact with. I'm sorry, I have now this, uh, this on the top. Um, but I, I, the most important one to see at the top, because this is the layer of, uh, of geoscientific software packages. I wanted to mention that there is a very active community in open source geosciences and Gempi links in seamlessly into, into many of these packages with GemGIS and others. And there's also a very vibrant user community where people uh, interact and, you know, post questions, discuss topics and so on. This is on the Software Underground channel, which just moved from Slack to Metamost. Uh, I'll leave a, a link uh, in the uh, I can maybe, yeah, I think I have a link at the end, but if you look for software underground, you will find uh, this, this channel as well. Okay. But one final word now, the final two, three minutes, I would like to talk about the future of, of Jampa of this modeling package. And one of those is that we, uh, we actively work on the code. Luckily we received actually a fairly substantial, um, research fund. Uh, which will hopefully start soon and allow us to, to do some more of the developments around Gempi. This is more technical, so I leave a lot of this out. Uh, it will come in uh, Q1 or Q2 2024, the next version of Gempi 3.0 with a lot easier installation, more transparent API, more user friendliness, uh, to put it simple. Um, but I wanted to show you one of the things that, oh, uh, that is actually striking. And, uh, Maybe something which also comes to your mind. I mean, we've been talking about AI methods, large language models and so on over the recent months, a lot, of course. One of the things that I think is uh, especially interesting, if you use things like uh, methods like ChatGPT, GPT, other large language models, is their way to generate um, uh, code, scientific code. And I tried this recently. I mean, this is something I tried directly after ChatGPT came out last November. But the new version of GPT is actually getting quite powerful in helping you code. I did this just before uh, the presentation today, and I would like to show this to you uh, just as a quick video cast. So what I tried basically is to say, first of all, you know, GPT, do you know what Jampa is? Yes, Jampa is an open source package, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's fine some of the key features uh, talks about implicit modeling, which is interesting and, you know, be free to have a discussion with uh, GPT on implicit modeling. It's actually quite insightful. I think flexibility, let me move forward a little bit because one of the things I want to show you is this, um, oops. Can I not hide this pen? Automatic. Um... Yeah, okay. No, it's not showing me the web pen. Mm. Screen pointer options. Sorry, it's not showing me the right pen hidden. I visible A. Okay, let's try. Okay, but it's telling us a lot about uh, Gempa. Yes, okay, let's move forward a little bit. And then I asked GPT, okay, sounds promising. Can you help me to create a geological model using Gempi? And this is where I have to admit at the first stage when I first tried this, I found it actually quite spooky. In the meantime, you all get a bit more used to, uh, uh, to GPT and what it's capable of. Basically, let me move forward a bit. I asked it to generate uh, some files and to give me this information and to generate something which looks like an anticline structure. So here's GPT. Certainly, to construct a model, this is the input data you use, okay? Orientation values and so on. And let's now go to uh, the next step. And then I said, okay, that's nice. Uh, 
And I said, okay, can you now help me with this, with this information to actually create a geological model? And off it goes. It tells me how I can install GemPy, how I can import libraries. And now this is where it becomes really almost magic. It tells me how to create this model. What I'm showing you here, I'm simply taking this code from GPT and putting this into a Jupyter notebook, copying the code to generate the model. And here we go. Did a small mistake here. So I, let me move forward to the next. Um, now I'm taking these input files, taking the code of these input files, copying this simply into a file uh, in, uh, in, in my code editor and so on. Loading this file, continue simply with the code that uh, GPT gave me. And I don't want to bore you too long. Uh, you, can, you, know, you can probably upload this later if you are interested, but I think you get the idea. The important point is basically it made a small mistake. I told it you made a mistake here. It says, oh, sorry, okay, you have to change this one name. That's it, okay. And then you say, give me the model and here's the model. And this is actually the, the 3D view of this model that uh, GPT created without any more interaction. I, I said, create a model of an antique line. This is arguably not a great model of an antique line. You could say this needs to be a bit improved, but I think it shows you uh, where these methods are going and where AI is interacting with open source code and open source tools to generate things simply by typing in what you like to have. Okay, so future developments, uh, really now the, the final uh, pre-summary slide. Uh, one thing we're doing right now is, as I said, Gempy, the development of such an open source project requires a lot of time, investment and, and people power. Um, what we do at the moment is we aim for a non-for-profit organization to support Gempy developments. We will provide the option for participation through consortia. And this really means that we invite uh, you and, and you know any one companies and uh, and service and so on to decide on the future developments of open source geological modeling. I hope I could show you this is far beyond what you know you see in a simple interpolation like Gempy uh, about future requests and maybe also dedicated long term support. And uh, the initiative is planned for 2024 approximately. I hope we get the start next next year. So you know. Get in contact and shape the future of open source geomodeling. Call to the community and to anyone watching uh, the video later on, I hope. Final summary, why, when, and how GemPy and GemTS? I hope I could show you that uh, GemPy is capable of generating state-of-the-art geological models with open source tools. Interactions of multiple sequences, faults and fault networks. I already saw some questions in the in the chat coming up here about this, and we can discuss um, directly now in the Q&A session. We already have models in many types of complex settings, and this is increasing while we do work in this, of course. I wanted to say that this is more than just a modeling package, if you like. Um, at the core of GemPy is this probabilistic machine learning library which makes it super efficient uh, to model a bit more tricky to install sometimes but something which is really uh, helping you to kind of generate also automatically models in a, with these uh, machine learning methods gempy is not a code to us it's a project and it's open there for contributions from the community but also from people uh, in the in the general community of geomodeling uh, structural geology tectonics geological surveys it's really open. Uh, we are interested in getting feedback and to shape the future, basically, of geological modeling. Can I say in the end, I hope I could show you that uh, these times, these are very excited times to work on geological modeling in general. I think specifically to open source geological modeling with all the developments we see around machine learning and AI. And well, it's a great time to be uh, in this field. And I hope I could also share some of the enjoyment that we have with modeling and with Genpai, of course. Thanks a lot for listening, being here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian, for your, your presentation of Genpai and GemGIS. So it's time to, uh, to move to questions and discussion. If any, you can, of course, raise your hand and, and ask directly Florian, or you can type your, your, question, your question in the, in the chat. And I will read it for you uh, and ask uh, Florian. I can see, see the chat somehow. Yeah, no, no question on the chat for now. I... It, Thomas has his uh, hand raised. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. <laughs> um, 
I have a question, rather you know, lightweight uh, usage of ChemPy. Uh, we have together our course in multivariate statistics. Yeah. There's always a problem with uh, the data set uh, when uh, the students work with it and there are missing values. So you, you lose some of your samples um, for different methods. Mm -hmm. um, there is no relation to where these uh, samples are from. So yeah. um, my dear uh, Juliet set up uh, uh, a Jupyter notebook uh, with uh, factor analysis, an idea to include some kind of 3D model um, showing the missing values so mm -hmm. when when they start a factor analysis uh showing which values uh, are not in the in the analysis uh remaining so mm -hmm. it's possible to to use that code directly in a notebook with a 3d view maybe you can also rotate it or is it a little bit more complex from the usage um it it could be fairly straightforward um i think well, we can have a look at this maybe maybe separately, but but generating these models and as I showed here, some simple models uh, installation, especially on our computers, should work easily. Um, yeah, we can have a look at that. Uh, I saw that actually some questions in the chat from before inside. Maybe we can go through those now. I, I managed to open the chat. Can GMGIS be used to model finite faults along strike and down dip? Um, not GMGIS, but GMPy can do that. Yes, at the moment the visualization of the finite faults is still infinite. That's something which we've been working on because it's something which, from the modeling perspective, it's not so nice to show. The The functions uh, functionality is technically is there. There was a question from Vincent. Could there be a way to control the interpolation limit of horizon surfaces like sharp contrast between foot wall and hanging wall? Uh, can you explain that maybe, Vincent, if you are here? These questions were often Vincent. Hello. 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 Yeah, yeah. What I mean is that um, will there be a way where you can um, define uh, a particular, um, let's say, horizon surface? You have a horizon surface where you can define an offset of a fault, and this offset of a fault, we have a sharp contrast between the the horizons uh, in a situation whereby the horizons are not supposed to be continuous. Mm, yes. uh, however, wherever it meets the, the fault or the fault mm -hmm. surface, that is the horizon cutoff, there should be a, a, a sharp contrast between the horizons. That's what I mean. Yeah, and between the hanging wall, yeah, yeah, between wall and the foot wall. Yeah, yeah, thanks. The hanging wall and the foot wall. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, a bit what you see in this picture here, yeah, I think from, from Aachen, I advise by this, this view that we have in here. Uh, you also asked about uh, the fault offset representation. Um, ah, sorry, that was, I see this was privately, sorry, I hope it's okay if I ask these questions now openly. Um, yeah, so it's sent privately to, to me. Uh, yes, so the problem with representation is really this, the way that we have to extract these surfaces from these 3D fields. If you uh, increase the, um, the resolution of the margin cubes in the background, basically, then you get a higher resolution of these interfaces. We have been working on, or we will work actually in this project that I mentioned uh, before. We will work on what, is, what are called octree methods for refinement, which will allow you to do this at a very low computational cost to a very high uh, accuracy. So that's something which is uh, definitely coming up. Uh, there was a question about annotation of sorry. cross sections. Sorry, yeah. um, sorry. Um, what what I wanted to to say is uh, with regards to the let's say, a displacement partitioning of, of the fault. Uh, in a situation whereby you want to define an accurate or you want to avoid errors in the displacement partitioning of the fault, uh, is there a way to use GMPy to do that where you have a clear cut offset? In this case, there's nothing like a continuous interpolation. Ah, in okay. this case, yes. uh, a clear in cut. This case yep. yes, uh, yeah, understood. What you would do there is uh, you would um, use a, a fault domain, basically. So you would say that I have your faults, and this is separating two domains, and you have one set of maybe typically maybe what you have in mind uh, is when we have a, something like a typical basin set and a basin boundary fault, where what we have on one side typically has no connection to what we have directly on the other side because there may be an offset of kilometers. Um, that's possible from the modeling perspective, what you would do is not use continuous layers that are offset. This is the default in GemPy, 
but you would use different domains, uh, hierarchical models. Yes, that's that's definitely possible. It's a way of, of combining basically these models, yes. Uh, there was a question about cross-section annotation. A tool to get the real world 3D coordinates from 2D images. Um, Thomas, maybe, can you explain what you mean? Uh, yes, uh, hi. In, in the first slide, you, you were pointing out uh, that people could uh, annotate or digitize uh, cross sections to get uh, interfaces points. And I was just wondering how do you, yes, and, and that one. The, okay. Yeah. How do you so, do this? Uh, is yeah. it from Jampy tools or? No, this is from uh, QGIS. So this is using okay. QGIS. You know, you basically digitize trace of your uh, of your section in QGIS, and then um, you set the the section that is basically on this line. This gives you then in combination with the X Y your your three D coordinate in real space. Okay. So we make use of this tool there. Ah, then there is another raised hand. Um, maybe if it refers to me, uh, hello, yeah. my name is Kamil Ustaszewski from Jena. I don't know why I'm, uh, why I am too, but you are number. Free. <laughs> actually I do have a name, so I, I apologize for maybe having <laughs> logged in too quickly. Uh, thank you very much, Florian. Uh, I would be curious to understand more about, uh, the capabilities of, uh, Gempi in, uh, it's actually also about, uh, cross-section constructions. If I, I, I. So far, I relied on more commercially available tools uh, that I don't want to mm -hmm. mention here. Um, but they allow me, for instance, if I'm in, in a folder thrust build, I can choose whether I, I construct folds using the concentric or dip domain method or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, how are these um, geometric uh, tools built in already in, in GemPy? Um, so you mean, would you do this in a 3D setting directly? No, no, uh, 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 2D for. First of all, so I have, I, I commonly construct 2D sections first. Uh, yeah, yeah. In, in this is really what, uh, yeah, uh, this is basically what this uh, uh, GemGIS workflow was, was a bit meant for. Mm -hmm. um, we do not have a direct um, interface or like a, a, a let's say, a GUI in, as part of GemPy. Mm -hmm. Yet, I mean, it's something which, you know, uh, as you know, as well, you're also at university, right? This is not something which we are, which we are there for as, as, as uh, university researchers, I think. What we have done, though, is to address exactly this type of question. Um, we, uh, we basically set up a company. Uh, we have a startup company from, from our institute with also people working in it from, from uh, the GemPy project. I didn't mention this here because this is really on the, on the scientific part. But let me post um, just a quick uh, link to a YouTube video where you can see this capability. Mm -hmm. And this is really giving you all of the interaction. It's going to be also a commercial pro pro product because you know, this is really something which requires a lot of, um, of development. Um, it's, uh, if I can say that here, of course, we all know the prices of the software will be a lot cheaper than the, the typical software that, that mm -hmm. is used. Um, and there's currently a beta testing phase. So if you're interested, you know, get in contact to try this out. Okay. Um, it will also have a link to to Gempi at some stage. Um, but as I, I mean, we are actually so to be fair, there we, we are always working on some also op simple open source inter uh, interaction methods to do exactly what you describe. Like in a, technically, this is possible. It just requires some dedication. The problem is we all we had some interfaces that were open source developed by students in some small projects. But as you know, the code basically decays after a while. You cannot use it anymore. And really um, keeping these uh, these methods on on top always uh, updated is is difficult. Mm -hmm. I mentioned before this uh, idea of this Gempi the Gempi project. So one of the things we would do if we get enough funding through uh, support from companies and so on, if we get this Gempi project running, then developing an interface, an open source interface, it would be free to use uh, by everyone, of course, would be a very high priority. But that's something which we can then do. But I think this is just not something where we, you know, as university, that's not, not our work. Thank you very much for your exhaustive answer. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I acknowledge it. Thank you. But this question is coming uh, coming a lot, so I hope this, this helps. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks. I see no no more discussion in the, no more question in the public chat except the question regarding the slides. So the once again the the webinar is.
is recorded, so it will be available in a, in a few in a few days on the on the EGS media. So you will be able to replay it if you want. We still have just a few minutes for more questions. If you have any or more comments, and um, so I'm posting the link here to uh, to these early access videos if you are interested. Um, uh, and I can post the link into the company. I have a question for you, uh, Florian. Uh, yep. You you know that uh, our expert group is dedicated to geological modeling, but also to geological mapping. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your presentation, you didn't talk that much about data. I mean, real data from the field. Yeah. Uh, so maybe it's because it's maybe straightforward, but I wonder if there is any issue regarding field data and the process you, you presented. Uh, no, 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 not at all. But oh, thanks for bringing this up, Philippe. Yeah. So um, the the input data you could use. Uh, I mean, the, the input data that we have is input surface contact points and orientation measurements. And uh, this means surface contact points, basically where you would find in the field when you do mapping and interface, and orientation measurements anywhere in space, like uh, what people, what you, of course, Philippe, know from from GeoModeler. Um, we use this. We use actually GemPy in a in a mapping and modeling course. So uh, of course, Philippe, you know the the fantastic course that has been done in LS for many many years, which I always uh, found really uh, amazing. Uh, what we do together with a colleague from Salzburg, um, Christoph von Hake, we basically go into the field. We do field mapping with the students, uh, and then we uh, digitize the data in QGIS directly from their uh, from their tablets and create a model uh, next year. We also want to increase this to consider uncertainties and then to see where, where, where should students actually go to reduce maybe uncertainty in the model mm -hmm. and to directly do this 3D thinking, basically to, to directly get your data, check your data in a 3D model and see how this maybe fits to your hypotheses and update this hopefully the next mm -hmm. day. Yeah, but where, where is your field? What kind of context, the juridical context is it? Uh, with the first uh, uh, was actually in, in, in Austria. This was a uh, and a bit some of the older sequences. I forgot the exact setting, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's in, in the Alpine region basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the next one will be in the Jurassic part uh, next to next to Salzburg. Um, yeah, that is quite a demonstrative for such a, such a tool. Yeah, that's what we thought. <laughs> so I hope yeah. it's instructive for students. I should also mention if you look at these YouTube uh, uh, channels and the the video. So one of the methods we've developing with uh, co combined basically then to modeling with GemPy. Uh, over our software, Liquid Earth, is that you can actually take your tablet, um, you know, your your iPad, do a laser scan of a of a 3D outcrop, position this laser scan in 3D space by simple point comparison, right, point matching, and then you could actually digitize this 3D scan later on on your computer or directly in the field, and this is directly the input for your model. That's something which I found quite amazing. So especially for if people are here to, uh, to who are involved in modeling campaigns and you are interested in this feature, you know, by all means, feel free to contact me. Uh, I'd be very happy to show you more about that. Um, I left it out here because it's not GemPy strictly, but uh, there's a lot of work directly aiming at making this interaction between data and, and field work as well and, and models more seamless, let's say. Okay, so yeah, I think we, we have reached the end of this uh, webinar now. So thank you, thank you again, Florian, for your presentation and your answers, discussion, and so on today. And thank you to all of you for your participation and, and watching. So bye bye.